Morning everyone, welcome to worship this morning. It's great to have you with us. I think this is the 20th one of these that we've done, uh, these Sunday morning worships. 20! That's good going, isn't it? Yeah. Good, so um, it's great to be all together and it's lovely to have my mum uh, with us to bring God's word later on in the service. Um, as we uh, think towards the week ahead, uh, I'd ask that you kind of hold in your prayers all those young people getting uh, A-level results later on this week and then GCSE results uh, the week after, including um, quite a few from our own church uh, or our wider church family. Let's, um, let's start with the psalm and then we'll have a prayer and then the service will carry on. So the psalm comes from uh, Psalm 84 and I'm reading verses 10 and 11. A single day in your courts is better than a thousand anywhere else. I would rather be a housekeeper, a gatekeeper in the house of my God, than live the good life in the homes of the wicked. For the Lord God is our sun and our shield. He gives us grace and glory. The Lord will with withhold no good thing from those who do what is right. Let's pray together. Lord, we commit this morning's service to you. Be with us now, fill us with your spirit. Let us give you the praise that you are worthy of. And we ask that you work through the words that we hear. Thank you that we can be with you and trust you and know your presence. Amen. 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 Good morning, everyone. This morning's reading is taken from the Book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 26 to 31. And the Holy Spirit helps us in our weakness. For example, we don't know what God wants us to pray for, but the Holy Spirit prays for us with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. And the Father, who knows all hearts, knows what the Spirit is saying, for the Spirit pleads for us believers in harmony with God's own will. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. For God knew his people in advance, and he chose them to become like his Son, so that his Son would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters, and having chosen them, he called them to come to him, and having called them, he gave them right standing with himself, and having given them right standing, he gave them his glory. What shall we say about such wonderful things as these? If God is for us, who can ever be against us? Hello everybody. Well, I wonder what you think these letters, when they're put together, will make. Uh, right, I'm going to put all those letters together and they're going to make one big word. Communication. Communication. Well, we'll find out what communication means, I hope, as we just go through these little uh, questions. Different types of communication. Well, let's see if your mum and dad can help you for starters. Beginning with B. A type of communication beginning with B. I'll give you a few seconds. You may have something different than me. But if you have, well done. This one I've got is this, which is body language. And this little girl folding her arms. And uh, she's looking like somebody, I wonder what she looks like to you, but to me she looks a bit angry. And her body language is telling me that. Let's have a look at this. E, something beginning with E, which is a type of communication. I wonder if you can get it. Email. You may have got something different, of course. The next letter is F. Now I wonder something else that we use to communicate with yes maybe you've got it our facial expression 
and that little pig looks like he's smiling doesn't he well we don't know if he is or not but we do use our faces to communicate how we feel our next one is H I wonder what H again using our bodies to communicate yes we often use our hands don't we and that thumbs up means that's all good and if it's a thumbs down it's not all good here's another one I right here we go I'm using this at the moment really to communicate with you the internet there we are how's about this one's a hard one you really might not get this or you may get something else of course a type of communication beginning with K well it's a funny word and it's klaxon kind of a loud hailer very loud as you can see that man's wanting to put his hands over his ears okay L now this is something that we all should do around Christmas time and other times as well but nowadays we're so busy using our keyboards but anyway there we go letter writing that's a way of communicating another way of communicating begin with M well I've just mentioned this one we use these every day well adults do anyway the mobile phone our next letter is R communicating beginning with R I've got one of these in my kitchen and I listen every day yes maybe you've got it radio how about the next one this begins with S now can you think of a type of communication beginning with S because the one I've got is rather funny it's smoke signal yeah the uh, Indians would use smoke signals to communicate a long way away to one another I don't know what they'd say like the enemy's coming or something I don't know but anyway what about T I think we look at this nearly every day I think you may have it already the television and how's about this one this is the most obvious one that I'm using at the moment you can't see me but you can hear me because I'm using my voice and finally this one beginning with P I wonder what you think it could be a type of communication well it's a communication that we use when we want to talk to God and we call it prayer well I'm going to quickly look at those and ask you a question before we have a story which one of these or which of, of all you know each one of them are they long or are they short distance I'll see if I can use my mouse to point to them the first one a klaxon well I would say that's long distance some of them are debatable a television someone is communicating long distance but it's kind of short distance because I can only really see the television that's in my living room voice is definitely short distance I can't hear the voice of the person two or three doors down the road they'd have to be in my living room now letter writing is definitely long distance it's a way of communicating with somebody who's a long way away again a radio is like a TV it's short distance I need to have the radio in my kitchen but actually somebody's communicating with me a long long way away smoke signal would be long distance just like the radio the internet is similar as well I need to look at what's coming over my computer from a short distance but somebody could be connecting with me from a long distance as with emails body language is definitely short distance and facial expression is definitely short distance texting on your mobile is long distance unless I'm asking Carol for a cup of coffee and I'm here in the living room and I want one from the kitchen I dare say that would be a short distance text but I don't think she'd like it if I did that anyway and a, a, a hand signal is definitely short distance but what about prayer is that long or short distance I'm thinking about this and I'm just thinking that maybe children would think it was long distance but the way I see it is that prayer is very very short distance it couldn't be shorter 
because God is with us all the time and God helps us to pray. And so in that sense, uh, it's the shortest distance possible, really, that God can actually help us in our praying. Anyway, we're going to look at a, a story today. It's the story of Peter. As I said last time, Peter had been, um, he'd met up with Jesus after Jesus was risen from the dead and uh, he'd been forgiven and he'd realised that the love that God had put in his heart had never gone away. And so he carried on preaching instead of becoming a fisherman again. And while he was preaching, he was getting so popular, people would gather around and the Roman soldiers didn't like that and the leaders didn't like that because Christianity was getting too popular. And uh, everybody was wanting to follow Jesus and it was causing a bit of a threat uh, to the leaders at the time. Anyway, so they took Peter to prison and he was there between two soldiers chained up. And meanwhile, back at uh, one of the friends of Peter's house, uh, they were thinking, now, what can we do? Peter's been put in prison. That's not good. What can we do? And they really didn't know what to do because they thought, well, there is a way of violence we could perhaps break through but we're not strong enough and we know that's not the way God would want us to behave so we can't we can't start attacking uh, the prisons and, and 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 setting Peter free well maybe we could pay them but no they haven't got the money so anyway that they can't do that either so they think the only thing we can do is pray and that's what they did they prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed and while they were praying there came a point of time maybe and it often is the case with me and he said you know we feel like giving up and I'm imagining they may have remembered one of the stories that Jesus told and Jesus told this story and it's a story of a man who had a friend had come to visit overnight out of the blue and so he decides to go to his one of his neighbours his good friend Bert and he says hey Bert and Bert says it's in the middle of the night and Bert is very sleepy and he says go away and he goes look Bert I need three loaves of bread and he says look will you just go away and he says look I'll be a mate Bert come on me old fruit he says give me some bread for my, my friends come over and he's hungry look my family are all asleep said Bert and then Jesus said, because he didn't give up asking, this is what happened. Bert put the lights on and he opened the door and he came to the door. Then he went to the cupboard and then he got three loaves of bread and he gave him the loaves of bread in no uncertain manner. Anyway, he got what he asked for and he went home and he thanked Bert very, very much. And he said he'd see him at work tomorrow. I'm sure Bert will be pleased to see him tomorrow at work. And he went home to his friend. So Jesus said this, how much more will God, who never ever sleeps and always wants the best for you, will listen to your prayer? If that man listened to his friend pray, even if he didn't want to give the food. Well, so they decided they must keep on praying. We must not give up. And so they carried on praying. And while they were praying, Peter was still in prison and then suddenly a great light came into the prison and the glory of that light filled the prison and an angel appeared and the angel set Peter free and he said come on Peter let's go and they got right through the prison doors and out and through many other doors that were shut and the angel led Peter back to the house where Mary and Rhoda and their friend were still praying anyway there was a knock on the door and they said, go and answer the door, Rhoda. There's a good girl. She was a servant girl. And so Rhoda said, yeah, all right. And, and she went and answered the door and opened the door. And who do you think she saw? It's Peter. And she said, it's Peter. And you know, do you know what they answered? They said, look, don't be silly, Rhoda. Here they are asking God to do something. He does it and they don't believe it. Anyway, all was happy afterwards and Peter and Rhoda said, well, 
aren't we the silly billies, said Mary and her friend. And uh, Rhoda and Peter said, yes, you are. You are silly billies. Where we learn something about prayer, two things. We must never, ever, ever give up praying. And we must never, ever limit God and think, well, there are some things God will do, some good things God won't do, and all that sort of stuff. We must just keep believing and know that God can do things that we could never, ever even dream of. And so I'm going to say goodbye. Good morning. It's good to be sharing with you today words which I put together over a week ago when I received the invitation to give this morning's message. I joined Berniston's virtual congregation on Sunday and as I listened to his wise words, I realised that David was quoting from the reading I had chosen to base my thoughts on today. I do believe that God inspires his preachers and worship leaders as these services are put together. So it was affirming for me to find that link. I wonder if you've spotted it already. You will get another chance. The Lord is my shepherd. I have everything I need. I love this modern translation of that first verse of the beautiful, familiar 23rd Psalm because my mum spent a lot of effort teaching her children to know the difference between wants and needs. And language does change and move on. But I would guess that no one watching today has everything that they want but I do pray that you have what you need. I know that even in the blackest times of my life when my mind has been numb and it's been difficult even to pray God has been there beside me and as Paul writes in his letter to the Romans his spirit prayed for me with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. I do know that nothing has actually managed to separate me from the amazing love of God. Mel Holden has put it much better than I can. He puts these words into God's mouth. Wherever you go, I'll be there with you. Whenever you stumble, I will hold you up. Whenever you're hurting, I will fold my arms around you. I won't ever leave you. I was there before the universe began. I am there with you now. I'll be there all the days of your life. I won't ever leave you. Whatever you face, I'll face it with you. Whenever you speak, I will give my words to you. Whenever you're lonely, I will hold you close. I won't ever leave you. Nothing you could do would stop me from loving you. Nothing you could say would change the way I feel about you. I will take care of everything you need. I won't ever leave you because I love you. I do believe that God listens to our prayers and that there is a mystical power in prayer available to us if we choose to open the channels as we listen to him, as we make ourselves available to God, he can use us, empower us and work through us. The more of us that are tuned in, the more his kingdom can come on earth as it is in heaven. 
I don't believe that God is some sort of divine puppet master, an interventionist God who changes the circumstances in which we find ourselves. But I do believe he can change us and give us the strength to cope with the circumstances, however awful at times they are. In these unprecedented times of global pandemic, I do believe that God is in here with us and that God will see us through. Studying Tom Wright's commentary on Romans chapter 8, I was struck by the name he gives to God in verse 27. He calls God by the name Searcher of Hearts. He goes on to explain that the root of the word searcher used here suggests someone lighting a torch and going slowly round a large dark room full of all sorts of things looking for something in particular. No doubt God who knows us inside out in searching the dark spaces in us will find all sorts of things we'd rather remained hidden. But according to Paul, what he'd rather find in each of us is the sound of the groaning of the Holy Spirit living within us. Earlier in chapter 8, Paul tells the early church that God does not distance himself from the pain of the world. Here he clearly states that God himself comes to dwell in the middle of the pain of the world he created. He's there in the middle of the church. He's here living in each individual in the person and power of the Spirit. And when we find ourselves at our wit's end, not knowing what to pray or where to, where to turn, the Spirit prays for us in a medium beyond words. I believe absolutely in a God of love. I believe that love is immortal and life is eternal. And again, I'm going to borrow someone else's words, this time those of former hospice doctor Sheila Cassidy, taken from her personal creed quoted in her book Light from the Dark Valley. I've added a few of my own, but I wish I'd thought of all of the words first myself. I believe that God is good, that he is loving, that he is truth, that he is freedom. I believe that God knows both my lying down and my rising, my depression and my laughter. I believe that God knows me inside out, loves me through and through, and that I'll meet with him in death and be reunited with my loved ones who've gone before. Don't ask me how. I believe, and again don't ask me how, that I know God. I know the unknowable God through Christ, his only Son. I know that my knowledge and understanding are very incomplete. And there are times when I just have to trust and be satisfied with not understanding. I also believe that miracles do sometimes happen and I can't explain that either. I believe that God loves people, all people, his creation. Not just the good, the pure, the beautiful, the Christians, but everyone. I believe he loves the mad, the bad, the mean, the greedy, the dictators, child abusers, terrorists, murderers, everyone. God is not mocked. He's not blind. He reads the hearts twisted by hate. 
the minds clouded by cupidity. He sees shining the grains of truth, invisible to men. Those seeds of goodness, lying dormant, awaiting a rain, a sun that sometimes fails. I believe that God has the whole world in his hands. He's not a bystander at the pain of the world. He doesn't stand like Peter, wringing his hands in the shadows, but he's there, in the dock, on the rack, high on the gallows, in whatever form those gallows may be. He's in the pain of the mentally ill, the tortured, the homeless, the refugee, those wracked by grief. His are the lungs choked by AIDS or coronavirus. His is the heart broken by suffering. He is the God of paradox, the God of power made impotent, the God of love. How do I know this? Again, I don't know how I know. I can remember parts of the journey that has brought me to this place of deep certainty. We call it assurance, don't we? Growing up in a Christian home helped. What a huge responsibility we have as Christian parents and grandparents, aunts and uncles, to demonstrate our total reliance on a God who loves us and who can be trusted absolutely. We need to show this to our nearest and dearest. As a young teenager, I was an avid reader. If I was missing, I could be found in a corner curled up with a book. I read ev everything I could lay my hands on. And I loved the Ruritanian children's novels of Violet Needham. A favourite was called The Woods of Windry. I don't remember anything about the main plot, but a side story of the adventure of a page boy lost in the woods who prayed for guidance using words he'd heard in the castle prayers. This story taught me my first bit of Latin, Lucerna Pedibus Meis, translated badly as your word is a lantern for my feet, which I discovered came from the longest psalm in the Bible, Psalm 119, and as a te teenager that aroused my curiosity. As those words settled in my brain, I looked them up in my Bible and there they were, verse 105, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And that discovery was exciting. And that verse became like a motto, a mantra, if you like, but also one of those arrow prayers that we can shoot off in times of need. There have been so many times in my life when I have struggled to know what to do or which way to turn. And I've cried out in my heart, Lucerna Pedibus Meus, show me the way, Lord. Be a light to my path. And he's always been there. Over 75 years, he has never, ever let me down. Oh, sometimes I've not recognised this presence. But looking back, I can acknowledge it was there all the time, in the silent nudgings or loving support of others, or jumping out at me from pages I've read or TV programmes or films I've watched. He's been there in that unexpected word of encouragement or affirmation from the most unlikely source. And his presence certainly isn't limited to Christian contacts and has shone through secular speech and action too. These have been, these times of trial, have been the most 
sometimes the most difficult to bear, when I can't find the words. And all I can do is try to be still and allow the spirit to groan for me as I wrestle with my grief or my pain or my fear. When my daughter Jenny was young, she went through a phase when she woke so many times through the night. I would go to her when she called, calm her down, give her a drink of water, tuck her in, stroke her back till she went to sleep. As I wearily bed for what seemed like always the umpteenth time. I would try everything I knew to settle her. I guess we've all been there at some point. Then, when I tried everything, I would say, Jenny, I'm going to wrap you up in Jesus' love and we're both going to go to sleep. The amazing thing was, this always worked. But I always felt I had to try everything in my own strength first. I think I've learnt a lesson and I know in my head that I can't do everything in my own strength. And I know now to ask for help, guidance, support every step of the way. But yet there are still some times that I forget and I try to do it my way. But the searcher of hearts finds me out and calls me back. And if God is for us, who can be against us? Those were the words of comfort that sustained me many years ago now, when I first had my um, concern about cancer. It was amazing. I slept when I should have been awake because I knew that whatever happened to me, God had my family in his hands and I had nothing to fear. As I finish, I repeat and affirm those wonderful words of Paul found in the closing verses of Romans 8. I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, neither our fears for today or our worries about tomorrow. Not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Good morning and welcome to our time of prayer together today. Thank you, Diane, for your teaching and testimony, which has opened up our hearts and minds to what God wants to say to us this week as a church. Before we actually go into prayer, I'd like to take this opportunity to explain a little bit more about the strategic prayer that you may be seeing in the notices and in the prayers each week in the services. It, this week, it will actually link really well to David's teaching last week and Diane's teaching today. So it's a good point to explain it. The, uh, we had a stewards intended to do this in one of our services, but we went into lockdown so we haven't had the opportunity. Anyway, the strategic prayer came about um, in the stewards meetings because we felt that we needed to cover all aspects of the church in prayer um, and to bring vision and wisdom into our everyday life and to God's glory and thanks for everything he does for us. We have got an enemy and prayer is really important not only in, in growing God's kingdom, but also in that protection that we need 
from, um, from the spiritual forces that work around us. And I'd like to just read this. I mean, why is prayer so important? Why is it? it we all have personal prayer. We pray, pray as a community of believers. But there was a there was this um, it was a, it was a tweet um, or a blog actually not tweet a blog that I found about Charles Spurgeon. Can I just read this to you? Charles Spurgeon, the nineteenth century London preacher, learned what it was to cooperate with God and see His power transform many thousands of people over several decades. People often travel to his church to learn the secret of his success. When visitors would come to Spurgeon's church, he would take them into the basement prayer room where people were always on their knees interceding. He called this prayer room the powerhouse of the church. If the engine room is out of action, the surgeon explains, then the whole mill will grind to a halt. We cannot expect blessing if we do not ask. So we felt prayer, as we know, is the powerhouse the church let it be our powerhouse and what well that's when we put the strategic prayer together um, and we want to cover as I said all aspects of the church you may have noticed each of these coming up week by week the vision of the church the leadership of the church teaching and worship the resourcing of the church our giftings discipleship and pastoral care mission and evangelism hospitality and community. These were sort of the four, eight, sorry, eight areas that we put together. And on a practical basis of how to do that, well, we'd, we declare God's word for each of these areas. And also we have it as a rolling program, four Sundays each month. So the first four aspects of the prayer, and then the following month, the next four aspects. Well, this month in Sunday, we have got five Sundays. So we've paused on discipleship and pastoral. It's key. If we are disciples, followers of Jesus, if we grow as disciples, then that's the impact that we can make in our own lives, in the lives of others around us and um, in the world, you know, that Jesus may be revealed. And this... Um, what we've started here as stewards, we want to be just as a foundation, a basis, and for it to grow. You know, we have our own personal walk with the Lord, our own journey with the Lord. Well, may this be a journey as a community of believers. And the idea is that we take each of these focus and we pray it on a Sunday in church and then we put it in the notices. And then if any of you, any of us in our groups, our prayer groups, our Bible groups, our own personal prayer, want to pray into that area, then during the week, please do. And also, sometimes it might be a bit of a list that appears in the notices, but use that list, pick out one aspect let the Holy Spirit work um, work through us individually um, to pray out what God wants in his kingdom at Burniston Church. So let's just take discipleship. Last week, um, David preached on Jacob's struggle and where you can all identify with our struggle. And at the ford of Jabbok, uh, Jacob met with the Lord and was transformed. But also, as David pointed out from Hosea, you know, he wept, it was difficult. And in the background, there was Esau. And Jacob could do nothing about Esau. It was God who could change Esau. It was God who could change that situation. And that's what Diana has preached on today. That at times, we have to totally trust God. We have to let go of things. And that's how I want to pray today that we can declare that we know that in all things God works for the good for... Let me just take this completely from my Bible. Let's read from the Bible. And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. We can declare that and believe that and allow God to change us. And we can't change... The circum our circumstances, we can't change others, but the Lord can, and that's what we can pray about. So I want to pray today for us personally, and have a time where you can allow those things you're struggling with um, 
to give them to God, to ask him to change you. And then we'll also talk about what we see around us because that's what God, he wants to change us. He wants to make us more authentic Christians. We want to do that. And then we can make a difference in the world. So let's pray. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for your everlasting, all-knowing and overwhelming love and provision for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice and willingness to die for each one of us so we could experience the new resurrection life in you. Come, Holy Spirit of God. Come and inhabit these, our prayers. Transform us through your word, through your spirit. Make us new. Draw us closer to you. Lord, we want to bring all of our struggles to you. We want to release things that we have no, no power of and no right to have power of. Lord, in these moments, can we give to you those things that we are finding hard in ourselves, those things in our loved ones that cause us such, that cause us pain, causes anguish, those things that we cannot, we cannot change. Lord, grant us the courage to change the things we can, wisdom to know the difference and the serenity to accept the things that we can't. Lord, we give things, all those things to you now. Lord, you said in your word that in faith we can become overcomers. And I'd like to now declare personally that we are over our circumstances. We are over the anything, Lord. Well, not we are you because we are over our circumstances, Lord, because you are the overcomer. You are Jesus. Your name is greater than any other names. Your name is above any suffering. Your name is above any pain. Your name is above depression. Your name is above cancer. Your name is above redundancy. Your name is above the coronavirus. Your name is above any kingdom, any authority of this world. Your name is above our governments. Our gov your name is over all, Lord. Whatever our personal circumstances, whatever our problems, whatever fears we have, your name is above fear, your name is above anxiety, your name is above sickness, your name is above all. And we just declare your name now over whatever it is that we or our family or our loved ones are struggling with. Just give you a moment now to say out loud what you wish to say the Lord is his name, Jesus' name is above. Thank you, Lord, that we have the victory. Thank you for that victory. And we look at our world. We want to become authentic Christians walking in truth and love. So that our faith is so powerful because of you living as Jesus, that people around us feel that, sense that and know that. Just like Peter and the disciples, when they walked, they met the man who couldn't, he was, he was a cripple. 
and they said, he asked for money, and they said they didn't have money, but what they could give him was Jesus Christ, and he got up and walked. Lord, we want to be authentic Christians like that, knowing that there's, it's not in our strength, but in the power of the Almighty, the power of the name of Jesus. So we look at our world, and we lift up what we see in our world around us, particularly now, and we ask you, Jesus, for what can we do? Well, we can pray. Oh, Lord, we can ask for you to be in the suffering that we see. We can ask you to be over coronavirus. We know that you are going to work in that and it will end because this too shall pass. It will end. We know you, we, you are there in the suffering in Beirut. Oh, Lord, think of the civil war that's gone before and now this horrific explosion that is shattering people's lives. But, Lord, you stand over that. Lord, be there. Be the, we, can't, not all, we can't all go out in mission, but we can pray for those who have been called to go out in mission there, Lord. So we pray for your hands to be on all the people who are seeking to make a difference there and in the people there themselves. May your spirit lift them, Lord. Lord, we hear of the, the horrors that are coming now as the economic collapse because of the coronavirus. The, 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 those people who are going to be caught in starvation, those people whose incomes and lives in our own country who has changed completely, who are facing uncertainty. Lord, we have people and places on our hearts. We bring them to you now and ask for you to be sovereign over this. Lord, just in a moment of quiet now, bring our own, what's on our hearts to the Lord. And our hope, Lord, is placed in you. You are the hope that changes the world now, that's changed the world in the past, and that will change the world in the future. Just say the grace for us. May the, Lord, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be upon us now the love of God be upon us now and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be upon us now and forevermore. In Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you this week. God bless you and God keep you. Amen. And the people said, Amen. <laughs>